Why is music so meaningful? How does music produce meaning? Culture lives by criticism. We can be work on radio and in the media. Dat is allemaal nogal uh, koloniaal van uh, achtergrond en oorsprong en ook nog altijd klank. Het is een uh, koloniale toestand. Ik wil vragen aan Birgit wat je probleem met muzikologie is. Now, a very warm welcome to today's panel on cultural musicology. I'm delighted to see so many people here today, so many people interested in the, in the issues we'll be discussing today. Today, in this symposium, we have the, um, I dare say, unique opportunity to explore systematically the potential dimensions of a cultural musicology. I'm Birgit Abels. I am Professor of Cultural Musicology at the uh, Music Department of the University of Göttingen. And, um, well, most of my work revolves around identity negotiation um, through music. Um, I have a rather post-colonial approach to uh, studying the musics of the world. And my geographic uh, foci, foci are on the um, Pacific Islands, particularly the western part, Micronesia, North India and the Southeast Asian island world. I'm John Richardson and um, I'm um, Professor of Musicology at the University of Turku. Um, my specialism is in cultural analysis of music. Uh, I've analysed contemporary classical music, um, popular music, uh, Finnish music um, and uh, music in multimedia contexts. Cultural musicology is a term, it's, we found out that it's been around for quite some time. I wasn't aware of uh, Fidelis Smith's definition going back to uh, 1959. Musicology, as theory, historical research and critical analysis, cannot do without the reality of music itself, and not merely by itself, but is understood in the total cultural web of its particular period. Yet, this is not enough. In order to understand music fully, we must also do research in creative thinking and philosophy and the aesthetics of world culture, in which music is an important factor. This brings one head on with a number of fascinating topics. One would need a background in philosophy, but also a specialized study of the whole field of aesthetics in, in its historical perspective and in its problematic. As far as the present writer is aware, no one has attempted to name this branch of musicology. It's not so much a branch as a window from which one views the intellectual struggles going on all around and trying to absorb what one can into one's speciality. In other words, it is a question of trying to approach reality as it is, one gigantic and patterned entity, even though one does so from one's own limited viewpoint. This type of musicology, which presupposes training in music, music theory and research techniques, perhaps could be called speculative but that word has been worn rather thin. Another possibility would be aesthetical musicology, but a better term would be cultural musicology. And I encountered the term in Joseph Kerman's book, Musicology or Contemplating Music, uh, that was published in the mid-1980s, where he referred to Gilbert Chase's uh, work, and, and that's how, how I came across it. When Gilbert Chase proceeded to use the term in 1972, he probably was not aware of Fidelis Smith's usage. Like many before him, including Charles Seeger, Chase was uneasy about the term ethnomusicology, and more precisely, the ethno prefix. A few decades later, Lawrence Kramer, who's here with us today, uh, brought up the term again, this time addressing what he called the fast aging musicology, and renaming it cultural musicology. 
what is the potential of cultural musicology? And as I see it, the potential is that it gives us license to move between existing categories. It opens things up as long as it doesn't become uh, orthodox itself and, 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 and in that way constrain us. And would you consider yourself a cultural musicologist, since that is the topic that we are? I, I think I would, although a number of reservations were expressed yesterday about whether we need categories at all, whether they're traps that we fall into that will just constrain us. But uh, for the time being, I, I, I see the potential of the term as freeing us up from some previous categories. Cultural musicology has a lot to do with ethnomusicology, um, cultural musicology as I see it, um, specifically in that it is the study, the cultural analysis of the musics of the world, and that means all musics, but since all music, all musics also includes the uh, European art music tradition, this would be uh, a major difference to ethnomusicology, which considers itself to, uh, to be studying the Musics of the world minus that which is usually called the West. There you said it, uh, the, the EM word, ethnomusicology. Yes. Um, why, why should uh, why should why should we get rid of that term when, when we are studying the musics of the world? Mm -hmm. It's a highly problematic term with a long history, and um, what what's problematic about it is actually. Uh, the ethno prefix. Um, historically speaking, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a divide in musicology, and this, of course, is a colonial legacy. It is um, a remainder of a colonial sense of world order, and uh, that in itself, for me, would be reason enough to think about alternatives for this uh, particular term. Ja, we zitten met een verleden, we zitten met een meneer Adler die ooit is, uh, dat allemaal uh, in kaart heeft gebracht, zo'n 130 jaar geleden neem ik aan. Hij wordt nog steeds geciteerd, wat natuurlijk uh, eigenlijk vreemd is, want die man heeft natuurlijk voor ontzettend veel verwarring gezorgd. Dat geldt ook voor een andere uh, figuur uit die tijd, Kurt Sachs, groot geleerde. Maar ja, uiteindelijk waren die mensen net zo zulke producten van hun tijd als wij producten van onze tijd zijn, want ze dachten in het evolutionaire denken. En dat ging dan van primitief, primitive culture, Tyler, daar praten we ook over de jaren 1860, 70, naar, uh, naar geavanceerd. En dat geavanceerde was natuurlijk Europese of Westerse kunstmuziek. En dat is natuurlijk diep geworteld. Uh, die discussie over die, die Europese kunstmuziek, of klassieke muziek, dat dat eigenlijk nog een product is van het koloniale denken, van het imperialistische denken, ja, die heeft natuurlijk nooit plaatsgevonden. De term ethnomusicology was first coined in the 1950s and adopted by the SEM, the American Society for Ethnomusicology, in 1955. The origin of this name, however, is conventionally identified with Jaap Kunst from the Netherlands. It replaced the label comparative musicology, which in turn is conventionally attributed to the 1885 publication of the Bohemian Austrian scholar Guido Adler. The institutionalization of the term comparative musicology some years later is usually attributed to Eric von Hornbostel and Karl Stumpf, and located in Berlin. In short, these histories have a notably northern European aspect. And if the label comparative musicology was considered no longer fit for use after some 65 years of service, does this mean that the label ethnomusicology is, in turn, fast approaching its sell-by date? This seems to be one of the key questions that lies behind our meeting here today, once again in Northern Europe. So, is ethnomusicology about to make an exit to be replaced by something more fit for our times? If so, why? And if not, why not? If you look at the curricula, then ethnomusicologists remain those people who study the music that is not European art music. And that, of course... Uh, Unless they explain 
that it's that their scope is broader than that. But yes, of but course, it, but it there remains are, problematic. Uh, yes, of course, uh, and also if ethnomusicologists do an ethnographic study of anything to do with European art music, North Atlantic art music, then you will all always uh, hear them justify that. So it's it's still taken for granted that ethnomusicology is thus the study of the musics of the world minus one, and that of course uh, speaks of. A, uh, of a mindset which has not really changed since the days uh, that um, the division of the world was more or less taken for granted, the division into the Europe uh, or the West, uh, including of course other parts of the world and uh, the rest. Ethnomusicology in its contemporary form is a methodology, it is, a practice of music, it is the practice of music ethnography. Cultural musicology by contrast is a generalised approach to studying music, but it is not a methodology as such. I don't think that a um, reconceptualization of what this ethno-prefix means, that this does uh, justice to this rather grave colonial legacy of the term. In short, the ethno in the name was often perceived to be synonymous with ethnic leading many people to understand ethnomusicology as the study of ethnic musics. However, today, ethnomusicology is primarily characterised by a particular methodology, namely the ethnographic study of music. In other words, the ethno in the name refers to the practice of ethnography, not ethnic people. I'm only too happy to identify myself as an ethnomusicologist, I cannot agree with him for the simple reason that um, uh, even if you talk about ethnography of music, you're still using a very colonial term. Uh, ethnography is something that uh, arose already in France in the eight, late 18th century and it became very big in the 19th century in Germany and in um, uh, England and in France. And it has always been um, about people who have the power describing people who don't have the power. I'd like to ask Birgit um, what your problem with ethnomusicology is. But at least in the way that I presented it earlier on, as basically being an ethnographic study of music and of being basically being anything. So I'm just intrigued to know what what you will make because if if it is the old idea of which you know of this idea of mapping the world and doing all that and it being ethnic and it being that then I completely go along with you. But I'm just intrigued that if it's a sort of very reflexive type of discipline, in the sorts of way that I was trying to present it earlier on, why you would then have a problem with it. So that's just, int I'm intrigued to know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, except that um, liberty that I feel is crucial for cultural musicology to, uh, to stay alive and to, to, to keep evolving and to, uh, to keep bringing up new, fresh questions. Um, we need this this um, this openness. We need to um, be able to um, yeah um, extend our interest to um, wherever we want, whatever we, we um, find. And um, for that, we also have to have the liberty of using methods we haven't thought about earlier. And the moment you um, create ethnic quality with music ethnography, that uh, um, possibility is um, limited. Ik noem mezelf een muzikoloog of een muziekwetenschapper, of een muziekonderzoeker, nog beter. Maar ik word natuurlijk vrijwel altijd voorgesteld door mensen als een ethnomusicoloog en dan corrigeer ik dat. Want ik ben net zoals mijn collega en vriend Wim van der Meer heb ik een ongelooflijke hekel aan dat woord ethnomusicologie. My name is uh, Wim van der Meer and uh, I teach here at the Amsterdam University. In fact, I've been um, successor to Ernst Heinz, who was the uh, uh, well-known specialist of uh, gamelan music, Indonesian music, and he was still a direct successor of uh, Jaap Kunst, a real, uh, the real uh, ethnomusicological tradition of uh, Amsterdam University. We used to have the ethnomusicological center 
Jaap Kunst hier. Wanneer je zegt, ik, ik ben gespecialiseerd op het gebied van Indiaanse muziek. En je zegt, oh ben je dan een etnomusicoloog? Dan denk ik van, nou wat is dat nou voor onzin? Ik ben een, ik, ik ben een, een muzikoloog gespecialiseerd in Indiaanse muziek. Mm-hmm. Dat, 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 dat heeft niks met etnomusicologie te maken. Dat staat helemaal los van elkaar. En, en mijn uh, wijle uh, collega Powers... Die had het altijd over Indic Musicology. En dat vind ik dan een veel aannemelijkere terminologie in feite dan dat je zegt ethnomusicology. Ja, maar dan gaat dat het heeft weer... Dat ja. heb ik te maken met mensen die uh, alles van Japanse muziek weten. Niks, daar heb ik helemaal niks mee te maken. De, die, die, daar, daar weet ik niks van, van Japanse muziek. Ja, maar dan gaat het weer en, over termen. En volgens mij is, moet het ja. gaan over wat je, wat je doet. En als je dat uit kan leggen, door hoe je dat nu doet en zegt van ja, en Japanse... Hoe je het doet. Ja. Ja. Volgens mij moet het daarover gaan. Mm. En, en nou, hoe je, of je het dan culture musicology of ethnomusicology of musicology noemt. Ethnomusicology. Uh, why is it so important to get rid of that label? The, um, the main reason I would say is the very concept of the ethnic that is there. It is uh, still a concept that refers to to primitive, to barbarian, to uh, non-Christian, to um, savage. Um, It is a concept that arose in the 18th century and it was very much part of the colonial era um, that uh, the white man would use the concept of the ethnic to describe everything else. I, I personally have a big problem with the whole ethno idea. It is uh, Michel de Certeau who attacked that very strongly and very powerfully and who explained that it is absolutely a p- colonial project, ethnology. and. Uh, uh, the uh, desire to know, um, to know the ethnic group and to define that ethnic group. As Certeau makes clear, ethnic groups that define themselves, that's one thing. But what, what we are talking about is outsiders <coughs> belonging to the group who has power. Who defined that? There seems to be uh, a kind of a natural divide there. A lot of people are very uncomfortable with that label. They don't really call themselves that. Others want to stick to it and say, no, it's, it's what we do, it's what we are. Um, and how that will play out, I don't know. I am not, never have been, an ethnomusicologist. So it's, I'm, I'm really uh, looking from the outside in. Um, cultural musicology. Well, that's During a long story. <laughs> um, I don't actually know when I happened upon it for the first time. Um, I do know that I uh, that I've been contemplating it for a very long time, um, maybe even um, uh, ten years or so. It was probably in, in the writings of uh, Lawrence Kramer. Um, in any case, new musicology. Um, that I happened upon it for the first time. Um, I uh, teach at Fordham University in New York City. Uh, I uh, have the position there of distinguished professor of English and music. Um, I basically, I interpret things. That's, yeah. that's what I do. <laughs> and I need to preface this paper with an apology because I'm going to start it by quoting someone with whom I have an obvious personal relationship, namely myself. <laughs> This is from the very first page of my 1990 book, Music as Cultural Practice, which John just mentioned. Quote, music has discursive meanings produced as a part of the general circulation of regulated practices and valuations. Part, in other words, of the continuous production and reproduction of culture. Close quote. These sentences form perhaps the earliest programmatic statement of what would subsequently come to be called the new musicology in capital letters or neon signs. Um, I've often expressed a preference for speaking of critical or cultural musicology 
in small letters. The terms critical and cultural are interchangeable. The point to take from the quotation is that new musicology was always cultural musicology, right from the start. There are many ideas of what all cultural musicology can be, and since this typical structure of musicology departments uh, to this very day um, stays very close to the idea of having historical musicology, systematic musicology, which uh, also accommodates music sociology very often, and ethnomusicology. Institutions, universities tend to be um, slow in responding to uh, developments in musicology, to academic, to intellectual developments. So um, intellectual developments have evolved at a different pace than uh, departmental structures, I would say. I really like the word, you know, the, the term uh, cultural musicology. Everyone, please uh, take a deep breath in. We need this now. And exhale. Inhale again. And exhale as you bring your chin to your chest while you close your eyes. So inhale. Stay there. My name is Tomie Han, and I teach at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, which is in upstate New York. And I study music as well as, as dance and, and movement in general. I feel very passionately about the involvement of movement relative to the study of music. I'm very interested in sensual orientations, or how the senses orient us. Because my work is primarily in uh, sensory studies and um, something that I like to refer to as sensational knowledge, embodied knowledge, mm -hmm. uh, my, my fascination is in trying to understand how the body is situated in the arts. Um, so not just music, not just dance, theater, and movement arts, but uh, and visual art, um, but how all of these are involved. Music and musical meaning speak to our senses, which necessitates a more holistic approach to musical analysis. Bodies are situated by sense, says Tommy Hahn. Music emplaces us and we emplace music. Our bodies too have something to say about musical meaning. <laughs> I am an ethnomusicologist. Uh, I feel like I'm in a, a, a AA meeting or something, <laughs> and performer. Uh, I actually don't care what you uh, call me, but um, uh, I play shakuhachi. I, uh, I am biracial. I'm uh, half German-American, half uh, Japanese. I was raised um, partially in New York and, uh, and Tokyo, uh, and I'm also uh, a dancer. In each culture, how we convey or transmit knowledge uh, really affects and influences how we understand what knowledge is in that culture, um, but the priorities of what is transmitted. Is pitch transmitted? Uh, how is it transmitted? Is movement even mm -hmm. interesting? Um, how all of these various sensorial aspects are conveyed. Culture and upbringing colors our worlds. As human beings, sensory selectivity, influenced by cognitive filtering and enculturation, shapes how we attend to information around us. Different cultures um, focus on different senses. Some will not touch mm -hmm. at all, yeah. and, and others do. So that's very interesting to me. One of the things that changed my life was with um, my headmaster, Iemoto Tachibana Yoshie. Uh, her mother, which is the quote up on the upper right-hand side, said to me during a lesson, karada de oboeru, 
uh, learn or know with the body. That little phrase changed my life. It's all embodied in the very mapping of our universities, how the body is, is really um, spread out. But you get my point, that when the sensory modes are compartmentalized in the academic arena, we lose the perspective of the humanity of the whole expressive sensory being. In everyday life, the senses aren't discrete. There's a great deal of sensory overlap. Perhaps the greatest examples are the connections between smell and taste or sound and touch. So, why do we compartmentalize them in academia? Understandably, there are practical and formal reasons, as well as spatial concerns. But it's a great responsibility for us to reconstruct the humanity after deconstructing it. We, we need to think about this. Um, I think it's a, it's a good avenue, it's a promising avenue. Um, I'm probably going to fall down a lot, but I think I learn a lot about things um, in academia and the public arena and by just the trying. Of the arts, I guess. Absolutely, in the arts, um, collaborating with other people. Um, I learned so much, and so just trying to work through those, um, those challenges of text or other kind of event is really important. And I noticed that um, the, the flute performance, that it, it was accompanied by a close description, a close reading at the same time. Actually a very descriptive text describing how it was physically executed. Well, let's try that first phrase again, but this time revealing the body mind. Growing the flute to my lips. And I think this, this form of close description is, is a way of getting closer mm -hmm. to our subject matter, uh, of establishing a more intimate relationship. Find balance between fingers, chin, and shabuati. Tilt head. Breathe in. Blow steadily and coordinate a finger tap. As my head tips down and then up. All fingers down. Hold the note out. Nayashi. Louder. Lydia Gurr uh, famously said, music has no meaning to speak of, uh, which of course is intended to be a pun. Uh, and Charles Seeger also called this uh, the major challenge of musicology, to speak about music when we all know that it's impossible um, to actually use words to express that which makes music so powerful. When the Society for Ethnomusicology first established itself, you know, culture was in a certain sense its rallying cry and its orientation was essentially anthropological. Um, the society was interested primarily uh, in folk music traditions, ethnic music traditions, um, and so forth. And at the time this happened, um, you know, people's awareness of the difficulties of the colonial legacy, which drove a lot of the discourse, was at a rather low level. I mean, we've become very aware of it since, um, but it uh, was not foremost in people's minds at the time. Meanwhile, uh, in the, uh, the quote-unquote mainstream, the American Musicological Society mainstream, I think culture was not an issue at all. Uh, culture was sort of assumed to be the musical culture of the West, particularly Europe, and music was supposed to be studied um, in its own right, uh, whatever that might mean. Um, so, you know, the origins of, of this debate, therefore, go back, you know, quite a long way. I think I'm talking at least 50 years um, at this point. And, you know, you can carry elements of this conversation back into the 19th century.
I uh, met a couple of um, uh, colleagues from the United States who absolutely get very frightened if you uh, suggest to them that the uh, concept of ethnomusicology should be uh, replaced because it is their way of defending their field from the traditional musicology that studies the European classical tradition. So, so there's also the problem of how it's been institutionalized Absolutely. in different regions. Absolutely. And they are very scared that if they uh, abandon the name ethnomusicology that they will be soon pushed aside and eaten up by the traditional musicologists. Het is natuurlijk ook een realiteit van de 20e en de 21e eeuw. We hebben steeds minder dat uh, oude uh, onderscheid tussen onze muziek en de muziek van de rest van de wereld. En het is ook natuurlijk zo'n concept als wereldmuziek waarin we dan <coughs> uh, ons af moeten vragen van oké, okay, wat is dan wereldmuziek En wat is dan de muziek die geen wereldmuziek is? Welke muziek hoort daar dan niet bij? Want als er, als er geen muziek is die er niet bij hoort, dan kunnen we gewoon zeggen muziek. En dat is natuurlijk ook um, de essentie van dit verhaal, dat, uh, uh, dat onderscheid muziek en wereldmuziek en op dezelfde manier ook het onderscheid musicologie en etnomusicologie, dat is allemaal nogal uh, koloniaal van uh, achtergrond en oorsprong en ook nog altijd klank. Het is een uh, koloniale toestand. En we zitten nu natuurlijk nu alweer in, de, in het derde millennium en dat is toch een mooi moment om dat maar eens even definitief af te schaffen. I don't think that historical musicology and systematic musicology and cultural musicology are separate fields. It's just that in, in one of them you put more emphasis on a particular approach than in another. And it's more a kind of an approach and a, and a point of view, a, view, a viewpoint, than uh, that you have really separate branches. Op zich is er niks tegen om het muziekwetenschap te noemen in zijn algeheel, zeggen Maar. Het nadeel daarvan is dat je dan wel het risico loopt dat de studies van de minder bekende onderwerpen helemaal zullen verdwijnen aan uh, de universiteiten in, hier in, nou ja, in deze landen die dat niet hebben willen handhaven. En er komt ook bij dat etnomusicologie nog steeds een gangbare term is, zowel in de Verenigde Staten als in, meest in Afrika, als in Azië, uh, als in Latijns-Amerika. Uh, dus waarom zou je een naam veranderen die wijdverbreid is, die bekend is, eh, dat gebeurt in andere vormen van wetenschap ook niet. Je gaat ook de sterrenkunde niet veranderen omdat de meeste materie in de zwarte gaten zit. Dus ik vind het een beetje een overbodige discussie zelfs. Natuurlijk, jij zegt uh, die term is ingeburgerd, die kennen we allemaal en uh, die moeten we vasthouden. Daarvan zeg ik van nou, daar, uh, dat geloof ik nou juist niet omdat die associaties met het, vooral ook het idee van het soort muziek wat daarmee bestudeerd wordt. En dat hebben natuurlijk sommige mensen ook geprobeerd te doorbreken. Maar dat is nooit gelukt. Dat is nooit gelukt in de etnomusicologie om dat te doorbreken. We zien al ruim een eeuw hoe dat er ontzettend veel wordt geleend over en weer. En hoe er allerlei hybride vormen ontstaan en fusions en noem het allemaal maar op. En dat is nou iets wat je eigenlijk überhaupt ook niet... He, methodologisch ook niet kunt tackelen als je niet een nieuwe uh, idee bedenkt over hoe, hoe kunnen we dat gaan benaderen. Want als je dat benadert met de methodes van de uh, traditionele uh, historische musicologie, kom je er niet uit. En als je dat benadert met uitsluitend methodes van de etnomusicologie, kom je daar ook niet uit. En daar heb je nieuwe methodologieën en, en nieuwe hybride benaderingen voor nodig om die hybride muziek ook te kunnen uh, uh, no truth is single, and there is no single root to any truth. There is then no the new musicology, no the cultural musicology, no the. But there is a cultural musicology devoted to saying everything about music, even as Derrida contends, quote, if it be under the heading of fiction, and the experimentation of knowledge, close quote. Open cultural musicology 
is an interpretive practice. It finds cultural meanings in music. But its questions and procedures are unlike those of traditional ethnomusicology because it does not take a certain concept of culture as a stable point of reference for describing musical activity. Instead, open cultural musicology is part of a more general project of open interpretation that is conducted by, as well as about music, and other cultural products. Open cultural musicology fosters a principled alternation between absorption in the music it addresses and reflective distance from that music. The distance enables the interpretation that the absorption both incites and inhibits. Music is a discourse in itself, and uh, this discourse is very important, potentially important to cultural theory and post-colonial studies, but it does take a musicologist to make this this uh, accessible for cultural theorists. So musicology has this op uh, unique um, capacity, opportunity to actually bring music into uh, post-colonial discourse and into uh, into cultural theory. And this is something um, cultural theory um, can ben benefit a lot from. One um, is the fact that about 20 odd years ago, uh, a good many uh, musicologists, and I think this kind of started in the United States, but it quickly spread elsewhere, um, became interested in the relationships between music um, and its total environment, social, historical, um, cultural, material. Uh, people wanted to know not just uh, what the music seemed to be if you abstracted it from all of those frameworks, frame, frames of reference, but how it presented itself to its audiences, its listeners, its makers, its uh, performers, if you took all of that into account. And one of the ways, I mean, there are a lot of different terms circulated. People talked about music and society, which is the title of an important book uh, published on the topic, people talked about music and cultural as cultural practice. I admitted that phrase is the title of one of my books. Um, so, uh, and other terms were used as well. So that, that represented um, a, a kind of uh, turning point. At the same time, um, the meaning of the term culture underwent an evolution. The term became something other um, than what it had traditionally been. And in a curious sort of a way, it was almost as if the West, which you know, practiced uh, this kind of, of anthropological, anthropological study, didn't have a culture. Culture was for the others. Mm -hmm. uh, and what happened in anthropology is that people uh, woke up to the fact that uh, they had to turn that gaze that they would uh, once have turned solely upon cultural others around the world, they had to turn it on themselves. They had to begin to think um, uh, about the ways in which institutions, materials, social practices, uh, uh, customs, uh, and so forth shaped their lives and the lives of their societies, their nations, their world in terms that would not distinguish them sharply um, from those which perhaps were less economically or technologically developed um, or which didn't have traditions of literacy and so forth and so on. So there was a, a kind of renovation, a transformation of the idea of culture um, and a growing awareness um, of the incultured nature of everyone. So all these things you know, came together and produced a kind of intellectual upheaval. Um, and it's the consequences of that that we're reckoning with. What we sh probably shouldn't allow ourselves to do is, is to let the labels do the work of thinking. I'm sort of temperamentally averse to putting limits um, on things and very much in favor of opening up conceptual resources on a broad, as broad as a front as possible. Placing music or anything else in what is supposed to be its context is no simple matter. How do we know what context is pertinent? Is culture a context at all? And why do we suppose that any context is bounded, stable, clear, or authoritative? 
Derrida raised these questions in his classic essay, Signature, Event, Context. The essay observes that every sign, as such, carries the potential of breaking with every context, and that it does so because of the intrinsic character of signification. But that is not enough. There could be, and are, institutions in place to limit this contextual migration. One might even define culture in its traditional form, or its traditional sense, as the collection of such institutions in force, the collection of such institutions that are intended to limit contextual migration. But the very presence of these limiting forms and forces points to something else. Culture demands contextual change. Culture is the demand for contextual change. And the source of that change is the very collection of signs and more, of discourses, artifacts, narratives, expressive gestures, anything that calls for a response that context is supposed to regulate. Culture consists in taking things out of context. It operates as a nearly irrepressible impulse to break out of contextual constraints. Cultural understanding is cultural action. That action entails interpretation. Perhaps the best metaphors for interpretation are musical. Harmony, polyphony, counterpoint, all things conducing to a movement of attention in many directions, on many levels at once. How could you use here the concept uh, of uh, framing? Framing is uh, an interesting um, concept because of its potential, I believe. Um, the way that, uh, well, it's recently been adopted in the sense of Mika Ball, the Dutch cultural analysis scholar, um, who actually suggests the notion, the concept of framing as a substitute for the rather limiting concept of context. Framing, again, uh, relates to the emphasis on subjectivity. It is not that music happens to happen in a particular context. We, as agents, as subjective agents, give a framework to music and only within that frame music makes sense. Um, so it is more about our own making sense of music than about context. Even an individual scholar can frame things differently within a, within a study. I think um, Rose Sobotnik has done that very useful in her study, Deconstructive Variations, where she moved between different scholarly positions. Ethnomusicology is the study of music and culture, the old mantra goes, but that's not just not enough, and maybe just not enough anymore. We need to grasp music's agency. In the past, we would study music as an object, as we would have a recording or we would have a score, and then we'd analyze it and we would come to the uh, definite conclusion about how it was its structure and how was its form and then we would have that ready and done and uh, um, I think that that ongoing discourse and that ongoing interaction with the music is what is important for musicology that you continue to see that it takes on new forms and it takes on new meanings all so the time. So it's not a frozen context, but it's about framing the process. Yes. Mika Ball's concept of framing can keep us from resting content with the study, study of music's <coughs> context and can help us reach beyond the presumed dichotomy between musical and verbal discourse. Ball, of course, didn't invent the notion, uh, but is building on previous work in cultural analysis. It is highly important to at least be constantly aware of how we actually um, structure, pre-structure the results of our research simply um, by relying on our established patterns of thinking. As musicologists, we too frame music. We make sense of it and give it a place in the world, in our world, of course. In this way, we produce our world order and the power structures in which music can take place. 
It is a sphere of action in which we naturally contribute to the production of cultural world orders. Power, opposition and struggle, authority, all of these have been concerns for musicologists for a long time, it's especially, of course, since the, uh, the rise of post-colonialism in the humanities. Globalization, both as a process and as a condition, has occasioned a great deal of musicological literature, simply because it matters to the many musics of the world. But our musical logic, our musicologica, as Jaap Kunst called it so programmatically back in 1950, the Academy's musicology, is not the only musical logic by which music is made sense of in the world. Thinking in and through music takes place all around the globe, and it's worthwhile, I believe, to think of these musicologicas as critiques rather than objects of, of study. Why is music so meaningful? How does music produce meaning? What does it mean? Well, music is a space in which our ideas about culture, society, place, history, about life meet. It's a discursive space where we think about who we are and who we would like to be. Gayatri Spivak, Paul Gilroy and others have proposed to analyze culture with a view to its planetary rather than global dy dynamics. Says Spivak, I have pro proposed the planet to override the globe. Globalization is the imposition of the same system of exchange everywhere. Planetarity is a term that um, accommodates a more sensory, if you will, and a less political conceptuali conceptualization of the material world. The human place in it, and perhaps most importantly, human responsibility within this world. Spivak, uh, in the same uh, little book, Death of a Discipline, suggests that we consider ourselves um, um, planetary subjects rather than global agents, a subject inhabiting a planet that is only on loan to us. Every square inch, square centimeter of this planet, call it a globe, call it a planet, has been fought over and has been claimed. Alternative ways of thinking, also alternative ways of thinking about music, have been compromised by centuries of delegitimization. This cannot be undone, and this globe will never become a planet in this sense. Perhaps it has never been a planet. We're too late for that. I think I'd, I'd opt for the term just musicology. And why do people want these different words? It's because it's a power struggle. There's funds and there's positions at university. How many people in cultural musicology are getting positions, how many are getting research funds. I'm missing always a discussion of power, and that's a vital, vital essence to the whole game. Macht, dat is een van de belangrijke thema's in culturele musicologie. Ja, Ik denk dat de andere, twee, de andere twee thema's die wij echt heel centraal hebben staan, dat is meaning, hè, betekenis, En dan het, het derde wat ons bijzonder boeit is de musicologica. Het denken door muziek. Muziek als denken. Ja. Dus het, het en dat zijn de drie dingen waar we eigenlijk zien als uh, speerpunten van een culturele muziekwetenschap. In de US zijn er natuurlijk veel meer ethnomusicologen dan hier. Dat kan je nog een baantje vinden. Daar moet het ook zo blijven eten naar. <laughs> maar het uh... is overpowered. Ja. Over macht. Do you get uh, opposition? by bringing this uh, new approach? Yes. Um, whenever you try to change or when, uh, whenever you are considered to be changed in extant structures, um, there probably will be opposition. This is mainly something that has to do with institutionalized structures, which um, of course have a lot to do with uh, a number of uh, jobs. Um, jobs are rare for, for musicologists, as we all know, um, but it's basically structural concerns. It's, it's a genuine problem. In, institutions, by their very nature, tend to create orthodoxies, tend to create practices from which people feel uh, that they cannot or should not deviate. And yet we depend upon such deviations um, to keep our intellectual projects alive. And I don't think that that tension can be removed 
from a university setting or any institutional setting. It, it's, a, it's a fundamental problem uh, yeah. that we are constantly needing to, to deal with. We do have to uh, confront um, the, this very complex, you know, if you forgive the term, culture that surrounds the question <laughs> of orthodoxy and try to negotiate its territory again. still in our first year that's taught in, under the label of general music theory but it's only one particular type of music theory of one particular time and that's what I'm referring to that there are so many different music theories that we have to try and understand that and that it tells us a lot about how we read music and how we understand the music. The term musical logica, musical, hmm. musical logic. Yeah. Can you uh, apply this in yeah. uh, your research? Yeah, I find that a very important term. Um, in, in a sense, Jaap Kunst uh, used that in his uh, first little book that uh, is called The Study of Ethnomusicology, but the real title of it is M Musicologica. Um, music logics, you could translate it. And um, it's about music as a form of knowledge also, that music itself is a way of thinking and um, in, in the same way that we are, we are talking now, we are using words, uh, language in the form of words, but when people are communicating through music they are also transmitting knowledge. It's a, it's a system. Um, it's not just any odd sound that just people make, uh, that whatever comes out of the body, but rather it's a complete uh, system that makes sense. Can we operate on many different levels? Can we write journalistic uh, work? Can we, can we work on radio and in the media? Uh, as well as um, this very heightened, elevated discourse that, that we do in academia. We seem to be measured by how many texts we write um, and how um, yeah. famous we become relative to the texts. Yeah, you have to be uh, quoted. You have to be quoted. And so I question this as well because I um, try very hard to balance my uh, performance or embodied life with what I write and um, there are different ways of expressing the same idea even um, to different people sometimes academic people and uh, how about the general public yeah. the general public doesn't read academic yeah. high theory high theory this is a shame because these ideas uh, are so vital for uh, us all to share. So yeah. I try to think of different different ways that we can express these ideas that's open to a lot of different interpretations but also different audiences. If I can try to say the same say the same thing in different sensory modes then we're really have we're having more possibilities of understanding so yeah. I try to do that in every presentation of course in text it's hard to do that yeah. but um, if I'm going to be there live with you then that's preferred. I believe it is very very uh, important to reach beyond the rather um, small circle of academics who are interested in questions regarding um, the cultural dimension of, of music. We have uh, a very, uh, uh, I would call a sick situation in which uh, uh, the production of a uh, university teacher and scholar uh, is done is exclusively through articles and books. Um, what you make in the way of websites or documentaries and so on, it all goes in the list of nice extras but doesn't count. 
we have to publish um, a number of articles per year and if you write one book that counts as a number of articles and uh, it's just out of question to do that in a different way. I've had students also who uh, wanted to do their uh, MA thesis in the form of a website. It's also not allowed. I really think that this will have to change at one time and in the field of music for the past years already I do with my students um, uh, they don't write papers anymore they uh, cr construct a website so um, I've been having um, uh, websites in, and they make their contributions on the website and they can integrate on the website a video and they can integrate music so when they are talking about something in in text, sure, they're still using text uh, in those pages, but they can illustrate everything directly with I images, with uh, video, with sound. And in the field of music, that is so incredible that we would still be dealing with books and have printed scores in them that, whereas you have all these new um, facilities yeah. at your disposal. My colleague uh, Henk Jan Honing also um, uh, tries to really bring uh, the field uh, to the larger public and he writes also books that are uh, for a broader uh, audience. But a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, people do not and they write uh, very difficult stuff and um, um, and they live in the uh, in the end they live in the ivory tower of the university and I yeah. think uh, I'm not in favor of that I think that uh, um, uh, it's essential to keep in touch with what's happening in music and what's happening in the musical world and uh, uh, and what people want to to know about it but of course uh, I, I would also say that it's important that people in university do certainly also work on that more esoteric level of things that um, that are really academic uh, because otherwise no one does it what i'm going to be talking about is something different which is really representation of music in signs and in graphics Basically, it's all about graphics that represent music in a way. Machines doing it for us. So, Matt Fessel started that together with Carl Seashore back in 1928. Phono photography. Seeger, 1949, he started together with his brother. He had this uh, idea of um, having a graphical a universal system of notation that's what he called it this didn't catch on which is really interesting to have a little indication of the difference between handmade staff notation and uh, a graph made by a computer I will uh, play the original piece sung by a lady <coughs> by the name of Shruti Sadolikar. Then I will uh, take the transcription in staff notation made actually for the Raga guide that was mentioned before. And uh, then uh, a reproduction from the graph that is uh, computer generated. Okay, the Staff notation. And finally, the computer graph. Um, 
this is just a very brief um, idea of where the differences would lie. And we think of music theory as something different, as something that uh, will only be talking about scales and notes and so on. But in reality, it's very much part of a whole cultural system and a whole way of thinking. It says so many things about how people think about music and how music thinks about people also at the same time. The problem of transcription that we are using one particular type of transcription to uh, write a music that has completely different kinds of, of categories and kinds of concepts that it just doesn't work. So that's, that's one of the essential criticisms of comparative musicology and of ethnomusicology. The world music scholars of today, they go on and on using the same system to this very day. It's really quite incredible. And all those ethnomusicologists, they were aware of it, but they didn't, they didn't finally take it up seriously. They, they went on writing in staff notation. The concept of Shruti, and it's often translated as microtone, uh, very uh, subtle types of intonation of uh, pitches, frequencies, and they are used in a very expressive way to give a color to the, uh, to the ragas that um, are so uh, fundamental to Indian music. Finding positions in sense for the Shrutis, you cannot. But that doesn't mean that there is not a, um, a um, uh, uh, Komal Rishab in Bhairo that is different from the Komal Rishab in Bhairavi. And that is Shruti. But it's not a pitch position, it's a totality of a movement that has its own ethos and its own mood and its own relevance. It is through Shruti that people magnify, you know, in, in Indian music, the distance from Sa to Komal Rishab, from the tonic to the minor second, that distance is only half a step, it's only, half a, it's only a semitone. But in Indian music, that, that space is expanded to a huge space. You gave an example of that in Göttingen, I think. Yeah. I'll show you a uh, uh, graph made of the Raga Darbari Kannada by Udai Bavalkar, and I'll briefly explain to you what is relevant about this. <laughs> Yes, it's huge, like a mountain landscape. And when you see the whole graphic of the, of the piece, you think there are other moments that should be far more uh, dramatic yeah. shifts, but they aren't. Because it's kind of uh, the, the microscopic view of that. By the slow uh, oscillation, uh, you pull those two notes so far apart from each other that you really get a feeling of enormous space. That's yeah. fabulous. Yeah. Here uh, we see what is called Ga in, uh, in India. <coughs> and uh, it's going from the second, the major second, to the minor third. And it's this particular movement here that he is uh, performing. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
And you must have noticed that in the, uh, he does that again later, and he'll do it again a couple of times. And it's very much part of the portrayal of this particular raga. You need that, that f crazy uh, movement from the second to the third, in which that space is created that's really a space of less than a semitone, and he stretches it out to such an extent that we really get a completely different view of tonal space. This is, it becomes huge. It's really uh, uh, part also of a cultural view, of a cultural approach that uh, is a different way of dealing with time. People will write them out in, in um, a, a staff notation. Uh, which is a very bad tool for writing Indian music. You cannot write half of, of, of the music with that. They'll make those transcriptions, put them in their articles, discuss them on paper, uh, whereas you could just have the, the, the music itself, you could have the graphs, you have all these things at your disposal, and um, still it's going on in the old-fashioned way. But uh, to understand music, to respond to music, fine, but another question, yeah. what is response? What do we mean when we talk about responding? Understanding is responding. Is there any single form or practice or even a coherent set of forms or practices to which the word belongs? And what is the distinctive, the particular modality of response typically invited by music? Or, because there is no one music either, far from it, what is the modality on which all types of music, whatever their idiosyncrasies, must draw? I pause because, of course, there's actually no comprehensive answer to that question. So what is about to follow is just one perspective on it. But a perhaps unlikely source, uh, Emmanuel Levinas, uh, offers a clue. In connecting the ideas of response and responsibility, Levinas makes a provocative statement. Quote, proximity is not a simple coexistence, but a restlessness. Close quote. Proximity here is my shared presence with another, the neighbor. The restlessness is a primordial, pre-signifying weight of obligation responsibility, indebtedness, and guilt imposed by the other's exposure to possible harm. Music is distinctive for the way it both negates and affirms Levinas' formula. On the one hand, with music, proximity is never restlessness. The music absorbs me, envelops and orients the feelings and ideas it elicits in me. It constantly reels me back in if I try to move away from it. Whether the music itself is restless or not doesn't matter. So long as I consent to keep listening, my relationship with the music is always intimately in tune. On the other hand, in addressing myself to music, I have to become restless. I have to seek restlessness. I have to marshal my entire experience as the subject of a language, a culture, and a world. I cannot do otherwise. In listening to music or making music, I am at the same time cured of restlessness and endowed with restlessness. Endowed, perhaps, with a form of restlessness no longer burdened by guilt or obligation. To understand music as cultural action, is to bear witness to this, to this experience as concretely as I can. In doing so, I must not be afraid to interpret, to re-signify, and to reimagine the music that arrests my attention. I must feel free to hear meanings and to speak personally where doing so can advance understanding. I must not assume that the music should somehow tell me how to think before I think it, or that the music and its meanings can be circumscribed by a determinate and determining context or historical archive. What I say about music should be understood not as a thesis or hypothesis based on specialized learning, 
no matter how much learning may be involved. But as part of a continuum of actions in which the members of a community of listeners continuously negotiate the hazards and pleasures of proximity. That negotiation is a discussion, and that discussion is, was, will have been cultural musicology as an open practice. So we, we are, uh, if, if we want to live up to the promise of this idea, we need to accept the notion that we are constantly fluctuating uh, between those positions and will not come to rest. Um, and I, that brings me back to that notion that I brought up and, and borrowed from Levinas of intellectual restlessness, which I think has to be a disciplinary presupposition. Um, it's our only safeguard um, against being too disciplined by our disciplines. Any a musicology that wishes to be cultural must also always already be critical. It has to uh, begin uh, with the assumption that all questions are on the table and that interpretation is necessary. But conversely, um, any in musicology that wants to be critical must also be cultural, and that it has to take into consideration the systems um, of mediations within which all of us live and function all the time. And you know, one final brief note, um, and that is that the term culture also needs to be understood um, in this, uh, from this perspective, the, the term um, it cannot be confined to its traditional uh, definitions, whether in anthropology or literary criticism or anywhere else. Um, uh, it, it, it too um, is constantly uh, in need of renegotiation. Um, and I think we need to uh, just remain open to its mutating meanings. It's, it's going to change every time we use it, and that's fine. I mean, as long as we can continue to keep the discourse flowing, we'll understand each other. There's, there's plenty of overlap, as, and, and for that reason, I think, so that we don't draw, uh, build up fences between disciplines. I feel that the cultural study of music or cultural musicology has the best potential at the moment. I think it has a, a, a tremendous potential for bonding different viewpoints. And, and I wouldn't mind if we changed to cultural musicology. It's a, a very open uh, kind of a term that inc that's inclusive. It would be very interesting to see how many uh, organizations around the world would embrace that. What characterizes this musicology, or what will be this musicology, for it has not yet fully arrived is the recognition that the meanings of a culture and the value of its heritage must constantly be tested and developed by thoughtful encounters, especially thoughtful written encounters with its particular products. In other words, culture lives by criticism in as broadly humane a sense of that term as we can find. To pursue the work of criticism, whatever the fate of specific works, is to help sustain the public sphere on which we depend to secure intellectual freedom and promote intellectual honesty. That is why one reason, that is one reason, why musicology, for me, must define itself not by how it comes to music, but by how it goes beyond it. Thank you. We should not let cultural musicology be just another name for ethnomusicology. It represents um, a fundamentally different worldview um, than the uh, kind of ethnographic one uh, and its descendants um, in ethnomusicology. And it doesn't limit its scope in the traditional way um, of ethnomusicology. Cultural musicology is the study of all musics, plural, all musics. The most valuable aspect of that for me uh, is that that means that uh, I can engage in interesting discussions with people who are studying music that passionately interest them and don't, doesn't particularly interest me at all, but I can learn from their interest in that music. And with any luck, the mm -hmm. same thing goes yeah. the other way.
So that if, if we think of ourselves not as theorists or historical musicologists, a term I've always hated, uh, or ethnomusicologists, but as people interested in the cultural study of music, uh, then we stand a much better chance of informing each other, stimulating each other, by dealing with the musics, the repertoires that we care about. And, you know, that makes the assumption that it is uh, both inevitable and actually a really good thing, given the enormous number of musics that there are in the world, that, you know, people pursue the ones that speak to them. Cultural musicology is not just a term to replace ethnomusicology, but uh, we see that, um, like Lawrence Kramer, he has been using the term also to describe the new musicology, which uh, is um, uh, a new approach, a cultural approach to music in the European tradition. And um, uh, so what I think is really crucial here is that we abandon this distinction between the study of the European classical music and the music, the rest of music of the world, because it's all music. And uh, as, uh, as John Cage used to say, music is music and everything else is everything else. A sort of uh, methodological stance to which I, I would gravitate. It's one which is committed to mobility um, and to a deliberate um, lack of precision. And that sounds like I'm praising something for being bad, but on the contrary, um, uh, there needs to be a certain openness, a certain readiness for transmutation in the concepts that we use. The concepts have to have the implicit in them, uh, the potential for their own transformation. If we try to uh, guard against that, if we try, try to make them too rigorous will simply end up making them too rigid. Cultural musicology is not a paradigm shift. To the contrary, it is wary of paradigms, and again, I'm referring back to the Göttingen Symposium, it is wary of new orthodoxies. We have to keep moving intellectually in order to keep getting a glimpse, at least every now and then, of what all music means and how it means. Music too keeps moving. And that's why we have to keep listening. I will try to read it out aloud. In order to put the reader in a position to judge the various musical accents of peoples, I have translated, transcribed a Chinese tune taken from Father Du Alde. We're not a club, we're not a, um, we're not a school of uh, uh, cultural musicology. That's very evident and I think that's a very good thing. I don't like schools and clubs, I'm against it. And it is ook niet bedoeld als een nieuwe naam voor een oud, uh, voor een oude wijn. Nieuwe wijn, oude zak. Precies. Ja. Alle wijn, nieuwe zak. Oude wijn. So, if you don't mind, I, I quickly go through a few, uh, a few things which will frame me framing the frames that we are framing. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> it was Wittgenstein who in the philosophical investigations showed quite decisively um, from uh, my point of view uh, the futility of trying to create firm boundaries for concepts. Um, I think it's one of his most important uh, contributions. And you know, so 60 years later, when I some, sometimes still hear people say, oh, you've got to be more precise, you've got to be more rigorous, you've got to... What? I say, wait a minute, haven't you read this? <laughs> we can propose terms all we want. Some terms stick, some terms don't. Globalization is the term that's going to stick. Uh, you know, the French, uh, or particularly, I guess it was Derrida, wanted to say mondialization uh, rather than globalization. Didn't go anywhere. I don't think planetary is going anywhere either, except maybe in the next Star Trek movie. Uh, <laughs>